every animal tries to avoid being killed. Self-preservation was programmed in us by evolution so that we don't all accidentally become extinct. But you probably realize that some species are luckier than others. Like the catfish superfamily, Loricariidae. Ever heard of it? These fish, or rather several species of them, were blessed with so many abilities and special features that are worth attention. First of all, these catfish have built-in armor. For example, bristlenose catfish are covered with a tough body armor with spines around their heads. And these are not just spines, they enlarge if the fish is in danger. Other catfish species are even more interesting. When a catfish feels threatened by a larger fish, it may extend the retractable spines that are usually close to its sides. This makes its body wider, which means it'll be more difficult to swallow such prey. Well, if the predator tries to do that anyway, sharp spines will cut into its mouth. The predator's lucky if those are ordinary spines because some species of catfish are actually venomous. Moreover, the venom of some catfish is so potent that it can kill a human. Approximately half of all known catfish species, there are about 3,000 of them, are likely venomous. But this ability is only used by fish as a defense. When the catfish sets its spines in motion, the pressure rips the skin over the venom glands. The venom spills out and gets into the wounds of the predator. As you remember, by that time, the predator is already wounded by sharp spines. But back to the armor that nature bestowed upon catfish. The entire superfamily, Loricariidae, has it, and yet I want to focus on certain species. The three-striped cori is a very small fish, the length of which doesn't exceed 2.5 inches. They're kept in aquariums, and no one even expects they can survive a piranha bite. To find out about this, the scientists had to pit two fish against each other in an aquarium and see what happens. Imagine how surprised they were when a cori was cornered, bitten ten times, and then wriggled free and swam away looking irritated. Cori wasn't hurt or scared, just annoyed. Any other fish would lose part of its organs in just one bite. The secret to the amazing durability of the three-striped cori lies precisely in the armor the scales of which are made of collagen and minerals able to withstand enormous pressure. Cori scales grow from osteoblasts, the cells responsible for building bones. A hardtop mineral layer of scales prevents the piranha's teeth from piercing the armor, and the soft layer underneath absorbs the force of bites. The scales don't split, the piranha is left without lunch, and the three-striped cori can keep doing whatever it does. Piranhas need to make eight bites just to put a dent in Cory's tail armor, and breaking through their abdominal scales works only 20% of the time. Well, even these amazing fish have a chink in their armor, the area around the gills with a gap. If the piranha sinks its teeth there, it can decapitate the Cory. To prevent this from happening, they flare out sharp spines on their pectoral fins and back and drive away predators. And how do you like the ability of catfish to breathe air? I mean, swimming to the surface and taking a breath. To gain this ability, the catfish had to evolve several modifications of the digestive tract that function as accessory respiratory organs. While this is not a kind of skill you might show off in front of your fish pals at a party, breathing air is required for survival. In some water bodies, there's too little oxygen dissolved in the water. In order not to suffocate, the catfish had to come up with something, but they used this method of breathing only as a last resort and only under stress. Also, in order to breathe with the stomach, it must have a little food inside, so you either eat or you breathe. But these aren't the only unique abilities granted to catfish by evolution, because some catfish can survive without any water. Common plecos from the Loricaridae family are known to survive out of the water for up to 30 hours. So people sell them in the markets alive, simply laying them on the counter. The catfish should thank the scales for this ability to live without water. The thing is, catfish are quite easy to spot in the water, so they become prey for birds. But the birds quickly realize that they've grabbed something prickly and very hard. After a couple of attempts to eat the fish, they give up, throw it away, and try to find a less feisty lunch. As a result, the catfish ends up on land and has to survive without water for some time until it manages to get to its native reservoir. Yes, you heard it right. These guys can also move on land. They get to the water in bursts of 3.3 feet per second, which of course is slow from a human point of view. But hey, we're talking about fish here. 
Fish aren't supposed to walk on land at all, let alone climbing walls like the Chetostoma microp species does, which belongs to the same family of catfish. Imagine the surprise of people who were the first to see this. A team exploring limestone caves in Ecuador found a fish climbing nearly 10 feet up almost vertical rock walls. What about gravity? <laughs> Seems like this fish never heard of it. And you, like scientists, probably wondered how a fish can climb walls. Well, it looks like the climbing ability emerged from a series of modifications to the catfish's fins, skin, and mouth. Yes, they use their mouth to climb. Add to this a thin film of water on the wall and you get a rock climbing fish. At this point, I wanted to make a joke like, what's next, fish that eat wood? But then Steve showed me the panache species. They also belong to the same catfish family. They're armored, have spines, and they eat wood. Moreover, they gnaw it. What for? Well, there's a simple reason, actually. Intense rivalry for resources forced the panache to find a way not to die out. And they discovered that there's always a lot of wood at the bottom. To include it in their diet, the fish have grown spoon-shaped teeth and jaws positioned at a high angle. But it's not as simple when it comes to digestion. Some researchers point to special intestinal bacteria that help the panache with this. Other scientists argue that fish simply can't digest wood. It passes through their guts in less than four hours, and catfish intestines don't have any unique structure. But what's the point of eating wood then? The panache catfish appear to be chewing on rotting wood to digest the organic matter, microbes, and microbial byproducts found in the spaces between the wood fibers. And the wood itself is excreted as waste. Other freshwater catfish from the same family are so tough, they can live in salt water. Usually in such conditions, the fish quickly dies from dehydration. Its kidneys are designed to pump water out of the body all the time, retaining salts. But catfish don't care about such trifles, nor do they care about the fact that they're fish, not moles. Actually, after walking on the ground, rock climbing and eating wood, there's not much that can surprise you about catfish. Common plecos, which I've already mentioned, are also known for burrowing into the banks, so intensely that they cause erosion and collapses. But other catfish like to dig too, for very different reasons. For example, to avoid unpleasant sunlight and heat, to care for offspring, or stay safe from predators, apparently when all other defense mechanisms no longer work. All this is quite exciting, but hardly for those creatures whose houses can collapse simply because catfish just love digging. Though this is not the only problem caused by catfish from this family. Since they're really good at survival, species from the Loricariodae superfamily easily become invasive. It makes perfect sense. When you're this good at adapting to everything and fending off predators, you are, by definition, cooler than everyone else. Plus, there's also people who keep catfish as aquarium pets and then release them back into the wild. This is how, for example, common plecos appeared in Florida, Texas, and Mexico. The catfish were released there on purpose, in order to control algae. In the end, the catfish spread to at least 13 Mexican states, displacing native species and causing serious harm to thousands of Mexican families whose income depends on fishing. In general, in Mexico, common plecos are not very liked, and even got the nickname devilfish. To get rid of the invasive species, catfish can be eaten more often, but locals consider the fish ugly, odd, and poisonous. This slows things down. But the strangest issue caused by the invasive catfish has to do with the manatees. Catfish cling to them. There may be 20, 30, or even 40 fish on one unfortunate manatee. It looks creepy, as if the catfish are going to tear it apart. Though actually, the catfish are not interested in either the blood or the meat of the manatees. They just feed on the algae growing on their skin. That is, they cause no physical harm, but imagine 40 creatures the size of a cat clinging to you. It's irritating. For manatees as well. In an attempt to lose catfish, they move more. And movement means burning calories. This is not good for manatees. The thing is, in the winter months, in order to escape cold and find food, manatees swim to the waters of Florida, which are teeming with catfish. But instead of a relaxing holiday, manatees get a bunch of annoying fish they can't get rid of. As a result, manatees lose weight and leave warm waters much sooner than they're supposed to. 
Eventually, a tired animal that lost weight finds itself in the cold. The result is quite predictable. Manatees get sick and die. Turns out that evolution gave catfish the ability to survive in any conditions, and they ruined everything. Well, nature has a rather weird sense of humor. See you later.